Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's episode, we'll take a look at how CUNY is responding to the challenges currently facing journalists. From Queens College to the Graduate School of Journalism, we'll take a look at the past, present, and future of the press. Our president recently called fake news the enemy of the people. But here at CUNY's Graduate School of Journalism, his words have become a call to arms. In my life as a journalist, I don't think I've ever seen um, my field under so much pressure. We've never really been accused before of being enemies of the American people. A few days ago, I called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. They are the enemy of the people. On one level, I was incredibly offended. On another level, I was incredibly proud. I'm proud to be doing the work of a journalist. I'm proud of our profession. If you're a reader or somebody who watches TV, you're starting to have serious questions about uh, the people who are the purveyors of the news. Are they honest? Are they telling you things that are factually accurate? Are they so biased by their own political motivations that they can't tell you things in a straightforward, factual manner? For many of our students, and also for working journalists, what some people are finding is that when they go out to interview, there's a level of hostility um, as they ask questions, as they try and interview people that they haven't had to encounter before, and they've had to really work much harder than they ever had before to establish trust. He's made it clear that he's going to be at war with our profession and to the extent that we can continue to hold power to account, continue to honestly report um, and factually report on the operations of this White House and this administration, it's going to require a level of investigative reporting that hasn't previously been necessary. Unfortunately, much of the media in Washington, D.C., along with New York, Los Angeles, in particular, speaks not for the people, but for the special interests and for those profiting off a very, very obviously broken system. The press has become so dishonest that if we don't talk about it, we are doing a tremendous disservice to the American people. Tremendous disservice. We have to talk about it. When he says that we're the enemy of the people, he's trying to discredit us because this is an administration that challenges the truth. So by kind of saying these things, uh, um, this like false rhetoric of like we're enemies, it's, it's creating a divide. But I think as journalists, we have to continue fighting that. We're living in this sort of very bifurcated country right now that is being manifest through how we process journalism, how we take in journalism. We don't look at a lot of stuff that may challenge our pre-existing beliefs because we don't even acknowledge that it might have value. Journalism is supposed to inform, challenge, enlighten. It's not supposed to be just there to, you know, make the people in power feel good. We want all our courses to sort of get students to think about, is this doing any of those things? Is the journalism we're looking at, or the journalism we're producing, helping to society, helping citizens be informed, be challenged? The questions you're raising are things I hope every journalism school is wrestling with. What is our role in society? What is our role now in society, given the current political system? How do we connect to people who have already dismissed us as fake or as the enemy. That's really scary. I mean, if you have people who won't even look at you or see your brand and say, nope, I don't trust them, that's a really problematic thing for society because those are some of the people that have stories that we want to tell, but also we have information that, as I said before, will inform and challenge their notions of the world. Depending on where you are, where you live, that people do live in a bubble. Here in New York, it could be in the middle of America. And I think as our job as journalists is to kind of pop that bubble and to kind of tell the truth and hold people accountable. Living in New York, we are in an echo chamber. With social media, you choose the news that you want to see. And a lot of people, myself included, we were all going through either reading or watching television that was very liberal. And so I think breaking through the echo chamber, that echo chamber that we've created for ourselves is incredibly important. 
and let's see what the alt-right is doing, what the left is doing, what the Tea Party movement is doing, and just being knowledgeable on all fronts. We typically have about 100 students starting in the fall of every year. We'll probably stay at that same number. We may slightly expand it in the fall. But what's been really striking this year is the jump in applications. Our applications are up over 40 percent. And I'm sure that the political climate and the desire to participate more actively in engaged dialogue uh, is, is leading that charge. My sense from talking with the students is that the uh, conversations that they're having in neighborhoods around New York uh, with underrepresented communities are ever more important. We have students from some of the seven countries who've been targeted. So it's really important for us that we get our students out into those communities and that those points of views and, and interviews occur and get reflected in the, in the press that we generate here. The issue is can we maintain that fairness, can we maintain that open-mindedness, that independence in an environment where everything is so deeply politicized. I think it's a very hopeful time. It doesn't perhaps seem that way um, at first glance, but if it engages people more, if the level of civic engagement rises, if the concern about the importance of journalism increases, that's all to the good. And I think to see the next generation so positively engaged in this discourse is wonderful. They say that it's never been a better time to be a journalist and that's how I feel. Up next, the man who coined the term viral media, Queens College's Douglas Rushkoff, warns us about getting news from computer algorithms. In an algorithmically concocted news space, the things we don't want to know about will go away. So if on the New York Times, if on the cover every week or so there's a story about global warming, I can choose not to read it. But it's there. I know I'm choosing not to read it. If I swipe left every time I see a global warming story or a climate change story, eventually the algorithm learns, oh, this guy doesn't believe in global warming, doesn't want to hear about global warming. We're wasting an impression if he's just going to swipe left on it, so we'll stop showing it to him. So the story goes out of my consciousness. If I don't want to know about the Afghan war, that goes away. If I don't want to know uh, uh, about black people getting shot, that goes away. But if I do want to know about white people getting shot, if I do want to know about black people doing bad things, then I start swiping on those and now my whole world becomes racist. My news sources now become racist without the editors deciding to be racist. It's the algorithm conforming to what it is that I, at my most impulsive worst, decide what's right for me to hear, what's right for me to see. Go, 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 next to woman. My email box is filled with everybody wanting to understand memes now. Because they go, oh no, this is a meme warfare. This is memes fighting. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Could a meme be worth a U.S. election? The billions that were spent on Trump were spent infecting the algorithmic news space with virulent memes, with ideas, and, and configuring them personalizing, customizing each meme to the person it went to. So even if you were a, you know, a Bernie Sanders uh, uh, begrudging Hillary supporter, you know, because she won the nomination, the money was being spent just to get you as a Bernie Sanders supporter to feel worse and worse about the fact that Hillary was now your nominee, to get you to be less enthusiastic. So everybody had messages uh, uh, pointed at them, had, had, had uh, 
And I guess that those messages masqueraded as news. People have to exercise a little bit of discipline in how they get their information about the world. You know, they're going to have to decide if they really want to keep feeding that almost amphetamine-like rush of panic that you get stimulating yourself with an algorithm, or do you want to start living a happier, better life and contributing to the betterment of our civilization? You know, it really, it's that easy a choice. If you like Walking Dead, if you really like it, to the point where you want to go there, where that's where you want to be, living in zombie threat all the time, then go there. But realize that's where you're going to take civilization, that we really will go there. And it's so unnecessary that there's ways to experience stimulation that's, that's much broader spectrum. You know, the stimulation of love or a soccer game or raising a kid or uh, riding a bike. Uh, and that kind of stimulation will serve you a lot better than uh, reading a conspiracy theory. I think people will hunger for news the same way a uh, really depressed person eventually seeks out psychotherapy or a sick person looks for a doctor. I think there'll be such confusion and such despair you know, as people really realize I don't know what to believe anymore. Is Trump the best thing to ever happen to the Times subscription strategy? <laughs> The Trump, Trump is the best thing to happen to the Times subscription strategy. Yes, he, every time he tweets, it drives subscriptions wildly. I think that there is going to be a last man standing. I think that, you know, The Guardian and BBC and New York Times and LA Times, and I think there will still be a few dozen important news sources. And maybe then if we, you know, focus our money and energy on them, then they can restore their agencies, news agencies in different uh, parts of the world. You know, models like uh, Associated Press, which is a co-op. You know, most people don't realize that. It's a co-op. It's owned by the journalists. You know, a model like that can start to grow as uh, hunger for um, genuine news rises again. If history is a guide, then the attacks on journalism are nothing new. Ari Goldberg has that story from CUNY's Graduate Center. The role of the press has been challenged in our current political climate. Of course, passions are easily inflamed when such founding pillars of our democracy, like freedom of the press and the First Amendment, come up. But is the concern warranted? To understand the present dynamic, we wanted to get a historical perspective. In the American system, unlike the, say, parliamentary systems, the British, for example, there is a very strong institutional oppositional role for the press. We don't have, for example, question time. Members of Congress don't get to question the president or his government. But that's what press conferences are for. In the United States, in our particular form of government, the, the press has taken an oppositional role. And that, for that reason, at least many legal theorists say, the press is entitled under the First Amendment to special protection. We have far more liberty for our press than almost any other nation on earth because of that intrinsic oppositional role. Andrew Robertson is a professor of history in the CUNY Graduate Center. One of his specialties is the relationship between the press and the government. According to him, we are indeed in uncharted waters, but it's far from the first time there has been an intensely adversarial press-government relationship. Perhaps most notably, the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798 under the Federalist Party of John Adams. So in the late 18th century, the Federalists were really concerned that America needed to define itself as a Protestant nation. And if these Irish Catholics were going to come in in large numbers, that could subvert the Protestant ideology. Now the Sedition Act actually resulted in the imprisonment of five of the most important opposition editors in the United States. When people accuse one party of aiming to erect guillotines in Connecticut 
or they are aiming to bring the king back from England or marry John Adams' daughter off to the king's son, then um, you can see that we have the same kind of wild and kind of scurrilous charges today. Is fake news a new phenomenon or just a new label for something that's always been around? There have been similar uh, kinds of uh, scurrilous charges, fake news, that occurred uh, on the eve of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was going to become a dictator. Many of these fake news stories that come out in the time of Nixon, again. Fake news is something that we had a long experience with. The problem is now, with the proliferation of media, with thousands of authors proliferating anonymously, all these stories uh, without any sourcing, without any opportunity for verification, I think we're in a very different kind of universe. What often happens is that these new media undermine the old forms of communication in what we call the press. So Facebook and Twitter undermine televised communication. The television undermined radio. Radio undermined newspapers and print. So we actually see a kind of clash between new and old media. So while historically, conflicts have always arisen as the press and the government wrestle with new forms of media, Robertson sees a new issue here, unique to the rise of social media as a news source now. There's just not enough room to explain anything. But if you have 140 characters to express yourself, you don't have enough information, you don't have enough grist, you don't have enough space to communicate what it is that you should be about. Where is Tom Paine? Where is the Gettysburg Address? Where is FDR's fireside chat? We can't do that on Twitter. Since you're attacking us, can you and without a clear agenda, or at least without one that's presented in traditionally fleshed out specifics, it's left to the media, in its historically oppositional role, to question the executive branch about those specifics, clearly often contentiously. Be, can you no, give I'm us a question? Give you a qu I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorically? You are fake news. Sir, go ahead. Can you stay categorically? That now, there have been bitter clashes between the press and the government before. During wartime, the communist scare of the 1950s, in the wake of the Patriot Act. But has the press ever before been under such duress as it is now? The whole idea of the press being enemies is something that is certainly finds echoes in the early, in the second Nixon era. He had drawn up a whole enemies list. There were hundreds of people on that list. Famous journalists, Daniel Shore, Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, these were all men that he saw as his mortal enemies. But the idea of the press as an institution being the enemy of the people, the, that language has more resonance with Stalinist language from the 1930s from, with totalitarian regimes than it does even with Nixon. That anything that they are doing, they can be subject to charges of lying, of producing fake news. The, even Nixon didn't go that far. Is the heightened atmosphere of tension in this country now, is the concern warranted? Or is it the more things change, the more they stay the same? And we've seen this before. It does seem to me that even though I've cited these previous cases, cultural conflicts, clashes between new media and old media, repressive actions by the executive branch, et cetera, it does seem to me that, that the whole attempt to create a kind of authoritarian uh, centralization of power within the executive is, is unprecedented. And I think that we have a cause for what Jefferson would call a jealous regard for our liberties. As with most things, a better understanding of our past gives us that much better understanding of our present. For Study with the Best, I'm Ari Goldberg. Social media has increasingly become the home for news and fake news. But as Jeff Jarvis tells us, there's a lot in social media and online news in general that needs to be fixed. In my book, Geeks Bearing Gifts, I, I kind of accordion the definition of journalism. At the broadest level, to my mind, journalism helps a community organize its knowledge to better organize itself. And that can include a lot. But at the very narrow end, when we worry these days about trying to preserve the most important elements of journalism. I'll be controversial here, and I think that journalism at some level is advocacy. Advocating for the little guy, advocating for justice, advocating for truth, advocating 
uh, for honesty. We are advocates for something, and we can't act still as if we're just separate from the community and objective and apart from life. No, we're part of it, and we have to, we have to recognize that and act like that. So journalism at its most valuable core watches government, finds corruption, asks the questions that aren't being asked in the flow, reports, and does the difficult and brave things. That's the core we have to preserve and protect about journalism, that journalism improves people's lives and their communities. Fake news is a fake label. There's no such thing. There are lies, propaganda, fraud. There's all kinds of specifics here. What's put under this umbrella of fake news includes things that are economically motivated. If you can get people to click on it, if you can put up a cheap computer ad on it, make a few pennies and do that millions of times, you can make real money. So we have to cut off the economic motivation for putting up junk. Unfortunately, the economic motivation makes everybody put up junk today. The other is propaganda. Uh, that's fake news, so-called, that has a political motivation behind it. And that's going to be harder to deal with. But the way we deal with that is not by trying to cut it off. We believe in free speech in this country. You have a right to lie if you want to. We have to find ways to gain the trust of people so that when we tell them uncomfortable truths, they might listen to us. So oddly, I think we have to start new outlets. And, and a, a chief among them is outlets that serve people who've never been served well in media, uh, African Americans, uh, Latino Americans, uh, Muslims, immigrants, women, uh, uh, people with disabilities, the list goes on and on and on of people who aren't represented in newsrooms and aren't represented in publications. But along with that, I also believe we have to better serve the conservative worldview in America, uh, because we don't do that. We in liberal media left a vacuum that was filled by Rupert Murdoch and Breitbart and Drudge and far worse. <laughs> John Borthwick, who heads Betaworks uh, in the city, a, a, an incubator for many, many companies here, and I came up with 15 things that we think that Facebook and Google and media can do. Uh, among them, and some of these things have already started, Facebook needs to be able to work with media to bring more true news to people at the moment in which they're going to click and read or share. And Facebook already has that mechanism to say, here's a related item. It may be a Snopes item or, a, or a, something else that says that's not true. We also need news literacy. And that may include saying, oh, that site you just linked to, it's only two days old. It's probably not a real news site. Uh, or that meme you're talking about, it's been spread around all over and been debunked already. But we have to go to more work. We can't just expect people to sit there and everyone in the world is a journalist who's going to spend a half an hour investigating something before they click. So we have to recognize that and not feed as much clickbait into the system. We've trained users this way in big time media because we wanted their traffic and we have to give them more information at the moment when they make these crucial decisions. So here at CUNY, I uh, helped start a program in entrepreneurial journalism, which enables journalists to start their own businesses and, and make their own inventions. It wasn't possible in the old days of mass media. You couldn't afford to. Now, with a blog or with Facebook, anybody can start a journalistic enterprise. I also helped start a program in social journalism, which really just changes the idea of what journalism is, takes it away from the idea that it's content, uh, that it's a product, and instead realizes that journalism properly conceived is a service to a community. We don't know what the internet is yet. We're still trying to recreate the old world and the new. We don't know what it can do yet. We don't know what artificial intelligence can do to listen to conversations and give us data and information and personalize for us. We don't know what it really means when absolutely everybody on earth has a television reporting device in their hands. We don't know how to listen to communities in new ways. The work of reinventing journalism has just begun. As a final note, Study with the Best wants to remember two pillars of New York journalism, Wayne Barrett and Jimmy Breslin. Barrett, through 40 years of investigative journalism, took aim at the city's political elite, penning thousands of column inches for the Village Voice and writing three hard-hitting books on three major Big Apple figures, Ed Koch, Rudy Giuliani, and Donald Trump. 
Jimmy Breslin's piercing observations and healthy wit kept him busy as a newspaper columnist for 50 years. He was a legend among readers and writers, famous for shining a light on those just outside of the spotlight. Both appeared numerous times on CUNY TV, and Breslin is survived by Ronnie Eldridge, the host of our own Eldridge and Company. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, visit our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.